I promise not to move too much around, uh, but I apologize to the camera. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Gonzalez. It is a pleasure for me to be with Elena Halain in her uh, first uh, route, and I'm sure it's not her last one. We all know the DevOps. Raise your hands. I'm not going to tell you anything new, OK? We're going to go over this quite quickly. It's a new development philosophy. We try to be agile. It's de deployed faster and faster. We produce more code. And what happens with security? We have to be there, and we have to be helping out. We have to insert our security requirements and make our analysis. We have to make dependent. And if we have the classical vision, we're going to be an obstacle. We have to be agile as well. And in fact, one of the things that we have to do right now is what they call the simlet, which is to be uh, earlier there to solve problems ahead of time rather than getting too late. We have to be already integrated within the teams and be dealing with security earlier. Just a sec, because this slide is like the origin of this talk. DevSec, Sec, Ops, Sec, because I, how, what do we call this? There's a bit of um, a mess with the name. You start Googling this, and when there is a problem, what's the solution? Then you Google it. So we, we Google this of DevOps, Sec. Nobody uses that. But this is security, traditional security. You do the development, you have the operation, everything is very agile, and then security comes along, and it's a stopper at the end. And there is another trend from our dear Elias sitting right there, which is the DevOps that says that uh, sec devs. And it says that the security has to be there at the beginning. That sounds great, but you came out second. And, and there's a, the DevOpsSec trend. And basically, security has to bring together both worlds. But why this talk? Why this uh, fuss about the name? Because we're focusing a lot on what we call this. And see, we're still missing out on the basic stuff. Uh, but how we configure everything, we do development a lot faster. Code is safer. Let's take that for granted. But the uh, design still struggles. And that's what we're going to focus on. But we've decided that our world is going to be an ideal world. We're going to start from an ideal world, and then we'll see what the problems are. So uh, we followed the box cycle, where security is already into design. In the IDE, we already have uh, security uh, completely involved. When you get to the integrated branch, one of the things that the Bob has is the agility, in that developers can have their own development, their tools. In fact, uh, ensure for them to be happy and creative. And then in the integrated uh, branch, we realize we do uh, that uh, there is uh, you're messing up, you're doing no code analysis, and and then we get to the development part where we do SSL analysis, passive pen test, uh, periodic scanning, and what for? So that when we get into production, the pen test should find real vulnerabilities rather than things like they could have found with a real, with an automatic tool two months ahead of that. How many of you work in a company that does this this way? Raise your hand. There's one brave person. So we, this is not quite there, but we are taking all of this for granted and say the problem is elsewhere. So we are generating all of this code, secure development. Do we mean that the, that the environment is secure? I can assure you it is not, because, because development environment is like when you order something by AliExpress, you order whatever, and 
And the only thing you get, you ask for this security guard, and all you get is this uh, balding man who is really not working very hard. Does this mean that our systems are poor and that no, it doesn't mean that they are poor. It means that we believe we have the bank access security system, and what we have is uh, this situation to the to the right um, with a turnstile that doesn't really do its job. Do you know what this is? This is a plan of Babylon. The Babylon example came up because we believe it was uh, going to look nicer and sound nicer than saying we're screwing up wherever we always did in the past. So I'm going to give you the model of this uh, Babylon city with all of these walls and security towers and uh, seven meter wide walls. And do you know what the legend is in Babylon? That it fell overnight and they don't know if it was because the citizens helped the enemy or because they, may, um, they were partying and did notice or because they went through the river in bed at a time in which there was no water. Can that remind you of what happens in uh, in some organizations if you think about perimetral um, security? Well, in the development area, the situation is quite similar. What happens to us when we do audits? When you go into the development uh, environment, you see a, a sign, a big, huge sign saying, please come in. And when you go in, well, since you're in there, you take a look around, you use the system to move around, and, and the audit is over because there's information in there which is very important. And this year we've had cases in which as, we, as soon as we went into the development um, system or the development environment, we already were system administrators. So why not? I mean, what else? I don't know how I'm doing with time. So we're going to give you the typical scenario. We have our, our developer team. They have a version controller connected to a discontinuous uh, uh, service, uh, a continuous integration service. And at the end of the day, what we want to do with the box is to be fast. But what are we going to talk about, really? What are we going to focus on? Well, the risks and the critical points that you find in a DevOps uh, environment. Information and secrets. Elena will talk about this. Vulnerabilities. Uh, permits. Or the permit that you have in the environment that uh, gives you a lot of weight of uh, what can happen and the exposure. So what hap has happened this year? We've met many customers who are like Mr. Banks. They have so many things, they don't know where to, where to start. So, yeah, because they have so many open doors, you don't know which one to choose. And what happens with that? They are like Mr. Banks. When you get with the report, with everything that's uh, uh, that's uh, wrong, they say, "Oh, I'm indestructible. Nothing's going to happen to me." That happens a lot in companies, and then I will tell you in more detail. As Danny has said, one of the most important factors to determine the critical elements in these uh, systems is the information that's uh, stored in them and the type of information that are going to be the goal of uh, internal or external attackers, such as what, well, what we know as secrets, users, keys, uh, uh, tokens, or anything that allows you to access or compromise other more critical systems in the organization, or simply any, uh, any other more sensitive information that allows you to do engineering, uh, social engineering, because the box uh, uh, tools are true 
treasure troves. Historically, the code repositories have been one of the main goals in terms of the search for secret, not just because code is a very valuable asset because it allows you to have detail about an application and look for its weaknesses, but also because sometimes other types of information uh, exist. seen, for instance, about internal infrastructure, service configuration, internal IPs, uh, uh, URLs, and sometimes because of lack of knowledge or, or you get um, uh, keys or secrets within the code itself that there are very well-known searches looking for this type of uh, secrets in public repositories based uh, on the uh, keywords and file detection. And I give you a link there. Well, I don't know if you can read it very well. We're with a compilation of, uh, of these um, keywords to look for this type of secrets. So we're going to give you an example of what you should not do. Inadvertently, we introduced a password in a comic. For instance, here, the typical example of access of a, to a database. Let's not uh, upload another comic by removing the, another commit, uh, removing the, using the password. Because if we do that, that makes uh, attackers' lives much um, easier. This sounds uh, silly, uh, but it happens a lot. You type remove password and it works. So any password that has been uploaded to a re public repository is uh, in danger. So. And one of the most famous examples is that of the access tokens to Amazon Web Services. The users have actually found uh, tens of hundreds of uh, instances running in their own Amazon account. And that's a lot of money. So GitHub, what it does today is to scan repositories looking for this type of credentials. And they uh, inform the service provider, Amazon in this case, so that they let the user know about the uh, possible fraudulent use of their uh, credentials. So there are good practices to avoid uploading them. And, and if there's been a problem, then um, saving, uh, sa erasing that information. But we not only find secrets in the code repositories. The task administrators in the last few years uh, are using agile methodologies. Who, who, how many of you have GitHub in, at work? Yes, definitely there are, there's plenty more. If you don't know what a task administrator is, it just helps with the project planning and with the follow-up of the progress of tasks. And with that definition, we, that raises an, uh, an alarm because it stores a lot of confidential information about um, projects and the internal development of the company or even information about employees. But not, that's not all. Sometimes you actually get real secrets there. So uh, passwords, for instance, the uh, signs uh, uh, that people use, the, uh, like the post it on the fridge while you, while you can see this picture is somebody who's using Trello as the manager of a, a, as a domestic a password manager. But in Jira, which is the most often uh, uh, used tool in companies, we can also get information, although it, it's usually properly uh, set up, that is with authentication, authentication in the private mode. There is an API, API REST that makes things life simpler for uh, the box people because it allows you to program operations from assigning issues, list of uh, users, delete, delete users. And of course, this type of uh, operations require authorizations, but sometimes do not require special authorizations. The only uh, authorization you need is access to Jira. And with access to Jira, we don't mean just logging in, but we mean access 
uh, without authentication. There are different uh, operations of this sort, but in the screen you have two, which are the most surprising ones in terms of security, because first it allows you to list categories of projects and also all the data, the store name and uh, description. And sometimes you find in descriptions things like this dashboard is confidential. Only administrators can access two points or semicolon and the name of all the administrators. So you have to be careful with the information you input here. Another operation that Jira allows for, and it's very juicy for uh, wicked users, is the users list. This operation, by default, uh, demands authentication uh, uh, because it's by default uh, assigned only for administrators. Uh, and it allows you to list all of their Jira users, their emails, and even their picture or the avatar that they have in Jira. But sometimes we have found that people change these default uh, authorizations. And in fact, in Jira, you can uh, give permission to, uh, you can put it on mode anyone. So even if Jira is on a private mode, anyone means that you share that with everybody. We cannot talk about the box tool without talking about inti uh, continuous integration servers, Jenkins, Bamboo, Tintiti, and the like. <laughs> How many of you has got Jenkins? <laughs> I don't need to finish the question. Everybody raises their hands. It's a key part or piece of DevOps because it's used like an orchestrator of the different development tools, security tools, or quality. Therefore, they have to communicate with all of these tools. And therefore, they store a lot of credentials, third party credentials, users, uh, code to process the infrastructural details. So they are the, the jewel of the crown for malicious users and for us in uh, security audits. When you see an environment, do you try to go to a Jenkins to get information? Well, no, Jesus, it's something basic and people don't do it. Yes, it's worthwhile. Only you two in this line have raised your hands. He is angry that you're not checking that. So let's focus on Jenkins, which is the more popular one. Why is it so popular? Well, because it's open source and then because it has many plugins that turn it into one of the tools providing more support to integration and, and to, to the other DevOps uh, tools. I'm going to explain roughly what Jenkins does. Jenkins defines the pipeline. The pipeline is an automated process through which uh, develop code becomes final product. In Jenkins, usually we define that in a file which is called Jenkins file, although it can also be done through the web interface. What's a pipeline? It has a phase, stages, and each one, and the big ones are build, test, deploy, have different uh, steps. A step is a single command that performs a single operation. It could be to clone the GitHub uh, code or to do a store. And it's important to know that Jenkins, most of the time, is executed in a distributed mode. There is a master where all information is stored, and then there are the, that, uh, the slave nodes, who are the ones who execute all of the pills, and in that way you distribute the load. And what can we find in Jenkins? We can find the source code each time you execute a bin. One of the first steps is to clone the code, and Jenkins clones it in a temporary directory, which is called workspace. And within this directory, you have all of the code and even the dot bit uh, um, 
portfolio so we can look at the changes and everything. So access, uh, accessing checking is just like accessing the source code for all applications integrated in the pipeline. But we can find not only that, but also, and this is also very juicy uh, when you're we can also find credentials integrated in the work themselves, like in the code repositories, people inadvertently uh, introduced the uh, credentials uh, as hard code. And so in Jenkins, every time you execute a bin, you can access the output of the console and, and see everything that's executed. And probably one of the steps will have been to authenticate against another tool. And for that, you need to introduce your credentials, and sometimes that is made public. And that's something that happens in the first uh, testing uh, bit, and that's why it's important to eliminate these uh, bits, because what the security auditor will do is he will look in the bits history and, and see what uh, information is there that shouldn't be. Uh, obviously, Jenkins has uh, plugins to avoid that. And what you do is when you define the pipeline, you create in the credentials as though they were um, environment variables. And when you create the step, and in the output of the console, they appear but masked uh, with asterisks. So we cannot see them in the logs, but where and how does Jenkins store this credential? Well, it does uh, it in an X uh, um, um, uh, file. How many of you knew that Jenkins keeps these credentials in this file? OK, OK, that's good. So what happens with the, the keys with which they quote these uh, credentials are in the same directory. So, um, so accessing the directory gives you access to the keys. But one very easy way of doing this is through the script console. The script console is given to developers for to find problems in Jenkins, but it's such a powerful tool that even Jenkins in its web page warns us that we have to say securitize this very well. You, you only people who really have to can should access because through it you can execute code of the master node, of the slave node, and that will allow you to do lateral movement to an eternal uh, network and you could even decipher credentials. Let's look at this uh, briefly. We're going to do a short demo. Yeah. I have four. I wanted to have to make just some screen captures, but uh, so we're gonna talk into our Jenkins. There we are. We're going to access the script console, and here we can easily execute system commands. I am not a typical woman. I can't do two things at the same time. Sorry. This is the user. And why is it important to have a Jenkins user? Because usually Jenkins stores these uh, credentials in home for the user where it's being run. So we execute it, and we obtain all of the credentials. Of course, these are all examples that I've made up. Username here and the password, which is uh, ciphered. But that doesn't matter. We copy it. This uh, console has solutions for everything. And we're going to use a method that Jenkins has. So we go directly and so we we run it. Oh, sorry, there's an S here which shouldn't. 
Google here. So you, you copy paste, right? Yeah, I did. This is the password. So uh, as you can see, this is very easy. Once you access the script Gun 12, and this is very easy for you to obtain and to get the credentials. OK, so let me speak about this um, Helena slide. So those of you who use Jira, do you, do you, do you know Script Runner? Um, uh, I'm surprised because not many people do know that. Do you know how this is being used to run scripts, actually? So surprise, same thing we do in Jenkins can be done in Jira. So you can run scripts to get credentials. Okay, then. So it's clear for everybody these tools store a lot of conf um, confidential information. So this is one of the main targets for all the malicious guys out there. So once we get one of these tools, the first thing we might think is what is their, what are their vulnerabilities to, to exploit them. So looking at the features of uh, Jenkins and Jira, this is worrying because 2018 was a very productive year, I believe, a year, I believe in, and 150 vulnerabilities of Jenkins were published. Looking at the different categories, we are, we are going to see that there exists um, a wide range of possibilities. So this was Jenkins and Jira, but for the other, uh, things are not um, as, as bad as that. So the rest of tools are not lagging behind. So over the last year, on a quick search, we could see that they all have a critical or high vulnerability. Here, how many of uh, how many of you does have all of them? And I think one person has a low vulnerability here. So searching over the last three months, three critical vulnerabilities were found. Two of critical arms first, vulnerability of uh, dynamic routing of Jenkins that allows evasion of identification. And the second is Good Life, one of the core plugins that allow the code to be executed. So we're going to see an extension of the second vulnerability for most recent vulnerabilities. The goal of this talk is not how to access and download a vulnerability, but to show you how easy it is to control one of the most critical features. So there you have the links with the details of vulnerabilities. I recommend you to go through them because they are very complete. Now, this is the real demo now. So not talking about uh, routing without a demo is never a talk. So we logged in. So if we access the information of our user, of course, Jenkins doesn't show it. So if we log off and we have access to the same information, obviously we are redirected because we are not logged in. Like I said to you, the first vulnerability was the dynamic routing of Jenkins. So if we include the perfect security area, and then we if we invoke methods that were not expected to be invoked this way on Jenkins, we can evade authentication, authentication and have access to user information without the need to be logged in. Not only that, we can also search for all the users on Jenkins using, um, I mean, typing a letter, for example. The second vulnerability is code execution. So. I have a prepared URL. So as you can see here, you ev evade authentication, and then you call the vulnerable plugging in the words of SPS. And we ask it to download a heart from the any route we want, the attacking route, and we ask it to ex execute in compilation time. And this is the pass by of the sandbox. So we copy paste. But before doing that, we include our server serving the hard. 
or the hub, I'm sorry. Now you can see that on the uh, screen and listening on family and port. So we execute the network I included. It seems everything was successful because we can read here success. So Jenkins downloaded the heart from the route we asked for, and this is the, the access. So who am I, the previous user? And uh, from that point on, you know all what is going to happen. But assume now that we don't want to have control on the Jenkins server, but on Jenkins app itself, because we can have authentication, authentication to do some things, but not all of the things. The, the URL will work, but other combinations will not work to access Jenkins itself. So I created another pilot, so we'll look for uh, um, um, heart, but we're going to create a user. So copy for you to see what the hard really takes. So we create this user as hacker, one, two, three, four. So for you to see that everything is real, we have seen in the list of users that we came up with before, none of the users is an attacker. So I execute, wait for couple of seconds, everything seems to be successful. Server, create user hardware was dub, uh, downloaded. Let's try to move around with this user. So the username was attacker. And the password is 1234. And here we are. And we also have Jenkins administration authorization. By default, all, all the users registered on Jenkins can do anything or everything. And Danny will explain us how authorization setup happens. I really love this. Go. This video. So everything can be done without authorization. So imagine what we can do, what we could do if we had an authorization to use all the services. I'm not going to go into the details because of um, time constraints. So Jira Jenkins have a problem because they leave setups by default. And they say, OK, set up this by, because I need it, which lasts for a while until the Jenkins and um, shut down. So the solution is very simple, the traditional one. So minimum privilege. So you should control the users to access as minimum data as possible. As easy as that. So this is an example of the Jira setup by default. Jira setup is OK. By default, uh, the mode is private with the maximum authentication attempts. Maximum three. CAPTCHA says is not activated or sign up by default. And the dashboard and uh, filters can be public. And when you say public, is for the entire internet. So the dashboard of your company can be public because, just because. I think it's um, meaningless, but it happens. So you can set up different uh, authentication. You can delete the max maximum authentication attempts, etc. And then Jenkins. And they are set up by default is a disaster, very agile. They are after speed. But to start with, um, it asks you to use the uh, their own company database. Then, uh, uh, you saw how long to, uh, to create a user. And users are, by default, administrators. This could be useful, or they might consider that it's uh, useless to spend time asking for authentications. There is there's, uh, one authentication that is good, but they, they 
say a caveat and say anyone can do anything, be careful with that because anyone who finds your Jenkins in your company or a locked off or locked in can do anything they want. Some, it is um, set up for them. So they use an authentication matrix. This is very simple to say what they can have, have, have access to, like other tools. But people don't use this or don't usually set this up. Let's uh, talk about figures now. These are vulnerabilities, yes. Only 221 interfaces with the 221 only in, on bam bamboo. What do you think the others are like in terms of uh, uh, security interfaces? Let's uh, see what the figures are. Jenkins is the winner again. And the data are really strong at the beginning, 15,000. Jira is sort of, I mean, TC is 2,500, Jira is 2,600, but then Jenkins is 80,177. So there are many Jenkins installations. So this is the second, the following thing we decided to research about. So this is the figures slide. I'll try to be as clear as possible, and I'm not going to confuse you with the figures. Otherwise, you will be counting and doing the maths, and you will forgetting, and you will forget listening to us. So Jenkins gives you a lot of information, URLs, etc. These are the Jenkins statistics. They give you a JSON where you can get the total of all the. Jenkins installations in the world at that time. We did this at the beginning of March. We did this again to see how data changed. And at the beginning of March, there were 228,825, which accounts for 35% of Jenkins installed throughout the world. 35% are exposed. And this is not bad. There's more, there's over a third of those that exist. So we decided to continue exploring. So we try to see what the number was of those exposed on Shodan. So we decided to see what the ex-genting was. They said, OK, no authentication. Uh, more or less 8% per of those exposed. 3% of total uh, facilities are set up with nothing at all. However, Jensen is wonderful, and they have another feature, another option, another JSON, which allows you to know in all the installations or installations or facilities the number of version, the number of plugins, and then and the version of plugins. So this is really focused in terms of studying, because, because you will know the company uh, that have them. So split on JavaScript, and we saw that 35% of those in statistics, 31%, I'm sorry, are vulnerable. And 41% of those exposed are also vulnerable. Therefore, using simple mathematics, the worst uh, case scenario indicates that practically 50% of exposed Jenkins are vulnerable to skip authentication. Either they don't have uh, authentication or you can skip it. 34% of the total setup Jenkins of Jenkins. So one third of Jenkins are screwed, screwed up. But uh, Helena showed you two demos, the one validating authen uh, uh, authentication and then the other demo bypassing Ruby. So we improved a little bit the script and we said, let's uh, see out of those vulnerable existing to authentication, how many of them are also vulnerable bypass, 66%. So I skip authentication, and I can also bypass you and become an administration, but because authentication by default is for you to be administrator. More or less 21% of the total, one-fifth of those existing in the world. And let me tell you something else. The research was only conducted, conducted about the two vulnerabilities explained and exploded by Elena. 
the total number was 150. And there were there were 50 of bypassing something. Anyways, that's uh, that's all for 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 figures. We know that 50% is screwed up. Our screwed up. No. So, who was affected by that? Who was impacted by that? Because at the beginning, when we were conducting the test, we thought uh, plugins will be or Jenkins will be um, set up by university students. And this is nothing important. Uh, sorry, but no. We found some multinational companies, and one of the multinationals operates in all these countries. We found them in universities. We found them in pharmaceutical companies or companies from other sectors. And I have to be a little bit uh, evil here, but software developing companies were found with um, 50 hacker teams, which expose all the development of all of their customers. Not all of the customers, but 20 something, which is mm, not bad. But just um, as an anecdotal, I was participating in a, at an event, listening to someone to someone speaking, and Elena and Miguel were sending me the code of the mm, presentation. So I'm at a, listening to a speaker that are presenting a chat box like this, and um, I, I got their uh, message saying, sending the code. So we're not going to disclose vulnerabilities. This is the caveat, because the vulnerabilities are owned by a third party you have confidence in. That's why we want to present this responsible disclosure. We didn't want, we didn't want to leave this presentation with, uh, without talking about three important things that happened this year. First of all, the mother of the year, as I called it. The well-known company. Do you remember Elena mentioned API to get information? We'll talk about this later. So Jira with the sensitive and secrets, sensitive things of uh, a, the company. So this event, this was the event, a certificate where we can see the username. It's not me. It's not a test. We did. We um, served the internet to see example of this company. So we saw Daniel, his family name, and then a code with a number, starting with a number, ending with a P, with the same number of digits. It seems that they have a sensitive data that have been exposed. Secondly, the second example, these two friends, they might be Tinder profiles because they look very nice, but it is not the case. Do you remember APIs? So based on APIs, during an exercise we were conducted, using Jira API, we got the number, I mean, the data of thousands or hundreds, at least, of um, users with their email accounts, their names, surnames, and their photographs. So this was en enough information to see how the company is evolving or who you can replace. But the winning case, the winning example is this company that makes everything easy for you, things that um, companies that make things very easy for you. We thought at the beginning, we're not going to find anyone as bad as those on the internet. Believe me, it took us some time. But the one, the person who set up, set up the same thing for other companies. Why am I saying this? I love this gift. It's so great. And why am I saying this? Because he set up the Jenkins for them, and you could access by default without any kind of credential. Clean. You could have access to this with uh, no trouble. So set up at the port by default. Authentication of Jenkins was uh, was there, so you became an administrator. You could have access to the terminal, 
And then something important for you to know that we were not tricking or so it's not a janking we took from six years ago. No, 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 that was the updated version. Can you see the number five in red up there? This is the janking warning, warning you that you have a security problem. So with the authentication, thing would be OK, because they were vulnerable to Groovy bypass, and they are vulnerable to the two versions of uh, Groovy um, vulnerabilities that exist. So without this, we could have done what Elena was mentioning, getting using script. And you have a certificate that you can use to do that, and these and there you are, and there you are, the password. But some people do things bad, and you might believe they do that on purpose, because they have their own Jenkins, and the GitHub hub will, uh, using what password? Using the same password. A private hub with the same password, where we could uh, download the company code. Like I said, this person made things very easy for you, and we did this for just for the just for fun, because all the codes were on Jenkins. You could take the code and use the code from Jenkins. So the conclusion of all this, just to con to, to end the presentation, the problem is not the software software. The problem is not the. Uh, the uh, skate you might use f very fast. The problem is the person who set up things like that. The development doesn't have any problem. The problem is the person who set this up. I know you want to be our child, but you cannot disclose everything. But DevOps is after agility, and security might not be a stopper and say, as we did in the past, this, is, well, this will never happen. Uh, of course, we need to be productive. So we need to start working from the first stop in a secure environment. You have to be flexible enough to, to improve productivity and to solve this and solve problems in one week. So we need to be agile. Things cannot be stopped. So this is the slide Helena mentioned with all the links. Of course, we will upload the presentation for you to know more in detail. Thank you very much. I hope you liked it. We hope you liked it. Thank you very much. Questions will be done using a mic for us to know who is taking the floor. So if you want to ask any question, please come to the mics on the sites on the right, on the left. Well, nobody dares. You asked who is using Tim City, who is using the other things. Oh, that's good for us to get customers, right? Nobody dares. No questions, no doubts. This never happened to us. No questions, I mean. Nothing? Nothing at all? OK, thank you. Maybe someone will come up with a question at the last minute. I'll be thinking about a question, and, the, and I'll ask the question later. Thank you very much.